morning's second scripture comes from the book of Luke, chapter 22, verses 7 through 20. And it's, it's a story we've heard many times. It is an accounting of the Last Supper, the community meal that Jesus gives to his disciples and gives to us as well. What's interesting to me as we read this scripture is how many times during the meal Jesus gives thanks to his Father. The Last Supper. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had, had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it, they asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I may eat with the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. This ends the reading of God's word. I think it's appropriate to share the story of the Last Supper, the Passover meal, where he gathered with his disciples as we gather to prepare for Thanksgiving. What's always amazing to me, and the more I read it, the more I pray over it, the more I understand it, is how he must have felt going into that meal, knowing exactly what he was facing. And to be able to give thanks. So 1 Thessalonians, we've heard that scripture many times, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, it says this, to give thanks in all circumstances, all circumstances. And here we find Jesus about to face the ultimate suffering. It's hard for us as human beings in our relatively small lives to understand the enormity of what he was about to face. The scripture tells us that he took upon himself the suffering of all humanity. Knowing each and every person ever, that ever lived or ever will live, he took it upon himself. Now, I know my own personal journey and I know how much suffering I have gone through. And I have some understanding of the level of suffering that each of you have gone through. You can't be human in this world and not experience suffering. And to think that he took it all upon himself just boggles my mind. And then, to know that he was going to face that, to give thanks, for me that's just profound. It speaks to me of his holy habit of thanksgiving. If there's anyone who ever understood what it meant to give thanks in all circumstances, it's our Savior Jesus Christ. He has that habit. We all have habits, right? Some good, some not so good. Things that we do as part of our normal routine lives, 
Perhaps we do them so often we don't even conscious that we do them. Some are healthy. They relieve stress. They can bring you comfort or peace. But what comes to my mind is a lot of people like to knit. You know, it's a habit. They just pick it up, they do it, they feel that, that comfort, that peace, just by simply doing it. And they miss it when they don't. Some habits, are, like I said, are not so healthy. And then a lot of times the reactions to underlying stresses or problems in your life, one of which I know many people struggle with is to be you know, Right? It happens so often you probably don't aren't even aware that you're doing it sometimes. One of my habits is whenever I go on a long trip driving across the country, I like to use toothpicks. <laughs> It just, it, just, it just helps me to relieve the boredom of seeing that white line go past the car over and over and over again. It's a toothpick. Ask my wife, she carries extras for me all the time when we go on trips. <laughs> Habits. Here in Luke, we find one from Jesus. And I want to share you with you some reading that I came across as I was studying, talking about Jesus' habits. It says, anyone that studies the life of Jesus will discover that he practiced some certain holy habits. For example, he habitually went to worship in either the temple or a synagogue. And on the Sabbath, he knew where you could find him. He also read the scriptures regularly. He knew the scriptures well and quoted them frequently. He obviously made a habit of studying them. Then he practiced the holy habit of putting his faith into action. Call it the holy habit of service. Thus we see him feeding the hungry, ministering to the sick, taking care of the lonely, ministering to anyone he saw in need. He also practiced the holy habits of giving, of working, he was a carpenter, and especially the holy habit of praying and giving thanks to God. In our scripture reading today, we find Jesus in the upper room with his friends. And they're about to eat. But before they break bread and drink the wine, what does Jesus do? He practices the holy habit of thanksgiving. And he took the bread, and when he had, when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. So why do you think it was so important to Jesus to offer gratitude to God the Father. Because Jesus, like he always does, is giving us the example of holy living. And he wanted us to remember that every good gift comes from the hand of our loving Creator. Now, how many of us actually sit at the beginning of a meal and say grace? I wish as your pastor I could say I do it every time I have a meal, but if I'm honest, I don't. But that's not simply what Jesus does here, does he? He gives thanks at least three times during the meal. It's an interesting scripture because we're, we're so used to communion where we just drink the cup one time and we share the bread. But here, we see Jesus is sharing two cups of wine. So he gives thanks for the first cup of wine, shares it, gives thanks for the bread, shares it, gives thanks again for the last cup of wine, and shares it. He's giving thanks throughout the meal. Talk about a habit of thanksgiving. Not simply a one-time thing at the beginning of the supper. So how does this tie to the Old Testament scripture that I had Betsy read this morning, the one in 1 Chronicles? It's one of those books we rarely get to when we're reading through our Bibles, it's Chronicles. There's a little bit of history to that reading that we shared. What we shared this morning is called David's Psalm of Thanks. And it occurs just after he enters Jerusalem with the Ark of the, Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> And if you remember that story, he enters Jerusalem with all of his men and everything, and he's dancing and he's praising and he's rejoicing as the ark comes into Jerusalem. This is well long before the temple's been built. It's long before Solomon's time. So he establishes a place, a location for the ark, and one of the very first things he does, he 
it establishes a holy habit of praise and thanksgiving. It's hard to catch when we're just listening to Scripture for the first time, but he assigns a duty to a guy named Asaph, A-S-A-P-H, and Asaph's man who accompanied him. And what's the duty that he assigns him? They're the ones who are to sing psalms in the presence of the ark. Psalms of thanksgiving. Asaph is a musician. He's a writer of some of the psalms that we still have today. And David, as the ark comes into Jerusalem, establishes this singing of psalms on a daily basis. Not only daily basis, but many times throughout the day. Jewish tradition and culture in the worship of the temple sing on Thanksgiving throughout the day. Not just one time. So David is so invested with thanking his Lord that he makes it a habit. A habit of singing psalms that, guess what? We still do today. We shared Psalm 111 earlier this morning. Multiple times of the day, it becomes something you do naturally. So how do we create a habit? If you're going to create a new habit in your life, perhaps you have something old that you want to get rid of, a bad habit, and you want to replace it with a good habit. What do you do? What's the process for developing a habit? Well, I went online, and I went to find out. Because I think many of us have tried to establish a habit and probably have failed, if we're honest, right? Something we want to do and incorporate part of our life, and we get started down the path, and eventually it just kind of peters up. This article I found had seven principles for establishing a habit. It says, first, set small goals. Little goals. Debbie and I like to talk about baby steps. Taking little steps to get you in a certain direction or a certain habit. If you start with a big goal, guess what? That gets difficult to accomplish. So you set little goals. Use triggers. What does that mean? Have things around you that remind you to do whatever it is that habit is that you're trying to develop. In the scripture where Jesus says, there's a great trigger there. It's food. Right? What better time to establish a, a habit of being thankful than every time you sit down and eat something? Do it early. Do it early. Early in your day when you're fresh and you're get full of energy. If you wait to the end of the day, guess what? I'm going to pick on Rick. You've been falling asleep in your chair in the afternoon, right? That's what happens to all of us. Do it early. Be prepared. Put a note somewhere that reminds you that this is something you're going to do. If it gets to the end of the day and you want to create a new habit early in the morning, give yourself a note. Remind yourself to do it. Be prepared. Be ready to do it. Make it convenient. Don't plan to do it when everything else is going haywire. I like this one. Make it fun. That really helps you establish a habit if you get enjoyment from it. And don't break the chain. This is the last stage of it. Don't break the chain. If you're trying to create a new habit in your life, don't skip a day. You have to be consistent and intentional at it in order for it to take root and remain in your life. Those are practical steps for developing a habit. Not necessarily a holy habit, but any habit. I like to go back to that story we shared in Luke in the Last Supper. And I see some of the, the, the steps that Jesus takes to make sure that Thanksgiving is a holy habit. He didn't simply say grace once at the beginning of the meal. He did it a number of times during the meal. What would it be like if we all sat down and said grace at every meal we had? Better yet, 
every time you stop and get a snack. Talk about a trigger to develop a holy habit of saying Thanksgiving. When I go to Dunkin' Donuts and I get my cup of coffee and my donut, why not say grace? Do it consistently. Jesus does it all the time. Gives thanks in all his circumstances. It becomes natural. And for him, it's there all the time. 1 Thessalonians says, give thanks in all circumstances. See, it's easy to give thanks after going through something difficult, something particularly hard, something you didn't think you could do. It's easy to give thanks then. When does it become hard to give thanks? In the routine, everyday events of your life, the things that we take for granted, we forget. We forget to say, Lord, I'm glad I got a cup of coffee this morning. It was easy for me to give thanks when I was in the woods with my dad Thursday afternoon. It's not so easy for me to give thanks when I'm writing yet another bill to the electric company. It's a habit. See, this is part of the pilgrim story. It's easy to give thanks when difficult things happen. This is when the pilgrims gather together after that, that first year of struggle and hardship. And they have the bounty laid out in front of them. It was easy to give thanks. It's not so easy to be consistent in that when things are going well. So I, it's my prayer for all of us this day, and as Thanksgiving approaches, to renew our commitment to giving thanks in all things, in all circumstances, mm -hmm. to strive to make it a holy habit. To be like Jesus. I want to share a poem that talks about Thanksgiving. And for me, it was profound and a strong reminder to give thanks in even the ordinary, everyday things. It's from a gentleman named Cortland Sayers. And it goes like this. Five thousand breathless dawns all anew. Five thousand flowers fresh in dew. Five thousand sunsets wrapped in gold. One million snowflakes served ice cold. Five quiet friends. One baby's love. One mad white sea with clouds above. One hundred music haunted dreams of moon-drenched roads and hurrying streams, of prophesying winds and trees, of silent stars and drowsing bees. One June night in a fragrant wood, one heart that loved and understood. I wondered when I waked that day, how in God's name could I pay? We can't possibly pay for God's abundant blessings, can we? We can only be grateful for them. And we can only remember to thank God throughout each day for his mercy and his goodness that has been showered upon us all. It's my prayer for each of us that we remember to make Thanksgiving a holy habit throughout the day and every day. Dear Lord, when we sit and we pull up that accounting sheet and we start to count the blessings that you have showered upon us, it is humbling. But we quickly realize we cannot possibly pay you for all that you have done. But you don't ask that of us. You simply ask that we praise you and give you thanks for what you have done. It brings you joy to make your people happy, to, to care for them, to provide for them. But it brings you even greater joy when we give you thanks. 
to Lord from the bottom of our hearts this day. We thank you for the life that you have given us, for the friends, for the family, for the community, for freedom, for air we breathe, for the food we eat, and the list goes on and on. So we thank you, dear Lord, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.